Hello and welcome to another Deep Dive Discussion. I'm Andrew Castile, joined as always by Pastor Richard Castile and Dr. Steve Schell. Today we're going to be talking about some important topics that come from the last two sermons that we've had at Grace Chapel in Scottsdale. Uh, one was on the second Adam and the other one is on atonement. Um, let's just get right into it uh, and talk about uh, the, the first issue I want to ask Pastor Richard in, in your message about the second Adam. What does it mean that Jesus is the, the second Adam or the last Adam? What kind of, uh, um, what are the implications of that? Well, it, it's God's answer to the sin problem that the Bible is just, that's one continuous issue is, is sin. Sin is man's violation of God's character, God's holiness, God's standard. Uh, you know, I often try to define the actual act of sinning as being when I, I make the decision to choose for myself what's right or wrong, right. and particularly when I make that choice in conflict to God's will or God's character, God's standards. And so uh, Adam sinned. Adam was in a perfect utopic environment. He was with a perfect spouse, perfect wife. Everything was the the literal ideal of what a lot of us think that if I was in the ideal I wouldn't have a problem because we think sin our, our problems are environmental they're not they're in here and when God gave us a free will he gave us the capacity therefore I guess to sin because we would then have the freedom to choose to elevate our own will against God's will and uh, and so when the first Adam sinned he did it as a representative of humanity and uh, not just because we innocently got blamed for his sin, but because he was the first human. And in, he just displayed what humans do. And so I always look at it. He was representative of us, but I was there too. And, and if, if it had been instead of the first Richard, instead of the first Adam, I would have eventually done the same thing maybe sooner because we don't know how many years they, he was in the garden before this happened. I don't know that issue. But at some point, he, he chose, and Eve was deceived and uh, was kind of cunningly brought to a point of her own will, and, Mos and, and Adam followed right in suit. So then God then decree decrees what he'd already promised, that if you sin, if you eat of this fruit against my will, you will die. So death immediately came into our universe into our world, as did man's blatant rebellion against God. And so Adam became the representative of the fall of man, we might call it. Jesus is now called in the New Testament, the second Adam, that he came as a solution to our sin issue. He came to pay the penalty of that death sentence that God had issued on sin. And and that's why when you read in Romans, there's this, this powerful, uh, uh, you know, not, not contradiction, but, you know, comparison. Uh, Moses, I mean, excuse me, Moses, Adam, uh, you know, because of his disobedience, many are brought to death. Because of his decision, many are found sinful. Because of Jesus' sacrifice and intervention, we are found righteous. We are forgiven. The penalty of their sin of our, our sin is paid for by him. And so that's the power of the first and second Adam presentation is that it lays out the source of sin and right in the very, you know, as I like to point out that embedded even in the cursing and in that whole, uh, when God confronts them about sin, he's already giving them visions of the hope that's in Christ and that he already has the plan of salvation, as we like to call it, where Christ will come and take our place on the cross, and he will bear the penalty of our rebellion and our sin, and, and he will also free us from the guilt, and then he'll also do a transforming work in us and cleanse us, literally cleanse us from sin, uh, which that to me uh, is, if I summarize as best I could, that is to me in a summary of the first Adam, second Adam teaching. So basically, Adam, as a, as a representative of all humanity, was given an opportunity in a perfect environment uh, with, with a perfect relationship with God, a perfect relationship to other humans, a perfect relationship with creation, was given an opportunity to live under the, the blessings of God, 
to, to, um, to obey God and uh, fell, that the, the fall was that, that disobedience of God taking to themselves yeah. um, the authority to decide for themselves what was right and wrong. And then in some way that, that guilt, that propensity to sin was passed on to all of the, the, the future uh, humans that, that we all received then uh, that propensity to sin. Dr. Steve, um, is that concept known? Uh, it, the, the idea of representation is important in this first Adam, second Adam understanding. Is it, uh, is it fair that, that we, all humans, are, are represented in this way by uh, the actions of, of another person? Is, is that a biblical idea? Is that an understanding that, that comes from scripture? And is that fair? What, well, what we don't, what, what um, uh, the original sin idea, which is what I think you're, you're pointing to right now, that, that does not mean we're all blamed for what Adam did. Uh, original sin is, is almost genetic. Adam, when he was created, he was made in the image and likeness of God. So he was made essentially, he was made without sin. He, he was not, it, the whole question is compulsion. Was he compulsively a sinner when he was made by the Lord there out of clay, he breathes into his nostrils a breath of life. He was not compulsively a sinner at that point. Sin, he, he, and that adds why, may I add, that Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus also was conceived of, of the Holy Spirit, and he was not compulsively a sinner. Mm. But temptation Good. still was very real. Uh, and, and so Adam, when, when he, let me just back up a second. It, it just, this is important. Why did God give them free will? Why didn't he just stop that? And we, we not have this. Why was it, may I say it, it was necessary, totally necessary for God to give free will to his human creatures. Because free, you cannot do two things essentially. You cannot love without the freedom not to love. I mean, you can create a doll that you wind up and says, I love you, but it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And God is not, did not make us as simply creatures to sort of take care of the planet. If he was creating children, adopted children. We, he was, his whole purpose has always been to fill his house with children. He has, a, he has his begotten son, of course, the Lord Jesus. But in his great love, love, love is expansive. And love has the capacity to love much more and he, he wanted to fill his house and to love us and to have sons and daughters who are glorified and become like his son, Jesus. That, so that you got to remember, that's where we start with. It. Well, if you're going to have sons and daughters, they have to have the free will. They have to be able to say, no, you, can't, you, 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 you can have a pet. You can, you can have something you raise, you know, some, like, like an animal, but, but that's not what we are. So you, in order to be... In order to be to love God, we have that free will. And secondly, in order to be good, goodness is not found in doing the right thing. Goodness is found in choosing the right thing, and particularly under pressure. And so God has uh, we has asked us to choose to obey Him. R Richard just nails it when he says the heart of sin is who decides what's right and wrong. And that he's totally right. That's exactly what the tree in the garden was. If you leave the fruit on the tree, God is, is, decides good from evil. If you pick it, you decide for yourself. So they, they, they chose and said, we will notice, we'll decide good and evil for ourselves. They weren't saying I'll choose evil, but we will decide what it is. Right. So in that, so if, if and, and that's why the repentance has to do with putting the, fruit back on the tree, as it were, letting God be God, trusting him, letting him lead by volition, choosing to, Holy. submitting to him. And that's, that's the glory of Christ. Here with all of this, this horrid uh, cross that was in front of him and all, he chose the cross. 
Yeah. He chose yeah, he, the suffering. He, he chose the yeah. shame for us, yeah. you know, uh, in, in obedience. Not my will, but thine be done. R Richard, please. Well, I just, I'm going to throw in there that how ironic to just point out what you're saying, just to make it clear for those, you're, you know, what you're pointing out is that Jesus, the second Adam, also had a garden experience. Yes. Not only did he have the wilderness, but he literally had a garden experience where he was under tremendous duress, isolated, alone, oh, abandoned. And there in that garden of, of Gethsemane, he chooses to stay subject to, the, to, the, to his father. Uh, you contrast that with the garden experience where they are picking the tree because it looks good, because uh, we'll all be like God, and, and also impugning God's character, where Jesus doesn't even ask the Father, why do you do this to me? This isn't fair. He just says, I don't know if I can bear it, but your will be done, not my gut. That is the counter, the second Adam's response to the first Adam's failure. I, I just, I love that picture that you were painting there. Well, I, I, I've never heard a sermon on the two gardens, but boy, would that preach. If you yeah, that'll preach, well. won't it? <laughs> yeah. oh, that's, that's gorgeous. That I mean, there are so many pictures like that where you see then Jesus be doing and, and like almost like representatively, but very literally replacing the failure with, with that. And then Jesus becomes our hope. If, if Adam's fall becomes our nightmare, you might say it, you know, our worst nightmare, our expectation that we're all bound to sin, as the Bible does say that, Christ then becomes, and that's what Romans 3 talks about, he, how much more will the gift of God through Jesus Christ set us free from the bondage to sin? I, I mean, that, again, that really preaches. That's why I had a lot, of, I'm having a lot of fun preaching these series, because it is, it is so, it is the heart of the Father revealed through Jesus for us. See, when, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, God says, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And what, it, what death is, is ultimately uh, separation. And in him was life, and the light was, so to be connected to God is to be connected to the source of life, just like plugged in, a lamp plugged into the wall. And so when they sinned, they were separated from God and began to die. The, 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 I mean, the physically began to die, but spiritually were now dead. Yeah, and this is, the, this is the condition that they pass on to all of their children and, and generations, include all of us. We all go back to Adam and Eve. We are born separated from God so that we try to handle life and everything without, our, without the power of the Holy Spirit. See, we're, 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 we are designed to live in the power. Now, this, I can't, I can't prove this, but if you'll notice that when Adam and Eve sinned, it said they knew they were naked. And there's kind of like, like, what's that about? I mean, how would you not know that? And what I, here's what I believe. I believe that because in their, in their state of sinlessness, they, there was a, there's that something about holiness that, that shines. Uh, the Lord always is brilliant light. I don't, I don't fully, and I believe they were surrounded by light. And that when they sinned, that left. And there they were. And so they really did go, oh my goodness, it's gone. Yeah. We're unclothed. Yeah. Yeah, that's and true. We're, we're made, like we are made to live, we were designed, the original model, the original human model was designed to live enclosed, as it were, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He becomes our guide, our counsel, he's our strength, he's our health, he's our, he's, we're made to live symbiotically with the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's gone. So here are, it, it, it's all of these human babies born into the world naked. I mean, and, and naked, not just they don't have clothes on, naked they don't have the, the Holy Spirit. And so now we all have to forage our way through life and find God in the process. But notice where do we end up when the Lord returns? Where, what, what is the end of all of this? We will live in a city which has so much of the Shekinah glory that there's no need for a sun, there's no need for a lamp, for, the lamp, for God and the Lamb are its lamp. Yeah. We will live literally in this brilliant 
light, which if we were to be in it now without a resurrection body, it would just, it'll destroy us. We're going up. For starting in the Garden of Eden, we're ending into a city full of light, resurrected, again, clothed with the glory of God, I think. Wow. That's powerful. That's a great picture because I don't think Christians uh, have an appreciation, particularly after we walk with the Lord for a while. And maybe even, uh, you know, I grew up as a, gave my heart to Jesus as a kid. And I do remember one encounter with the Lord where, where there was a sense suddenly of, of his presence leaving. I think he was making a point to me. And I remember that feeling of that, what you call, I was going to call it the nakedness of your soul is suddenly something lifts off of you and you are just so vulnerable and so empty. Uh, so I, I love that application to that. And it also speaks to the fact that as soon as they sinned, they became self-focused and they became self-aware that innocence was gone. And that's, you know, a child runs around, doesn't know or doesn't care that it's naked. Uh, there's an innocence to that. And uh, I, I think, you know, that the, 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 the negative effects of sin were so immediate and so so far reaching you know i mean even in the conflict with god they're blaming they're accusing each other they're you know and he you know adam after that renames her and or names her and calls her more or something like you know all these things began to happen uh, but i what i also found very fascinating as i looked into this is the promises embedded even in the curses that really struck me and i talked about that sunday you know the you you, you will crush his you know the enmity between the serpent and the woman you will crush his he will bite your heel but you will crush his heel paul yeah. talks about that in romans uh you know then of course the sacri you know how did he come up with these skins for the animals some animal gave their skin away and we know they don't molt those things off you know and so um <laughs> Uh, Before we get yeah, so, we get too far into the good news, I want to dwell on the bad news just a little bit. <laughs> okay, here. sure. Keep us oh, there. Keep us down. The so yeah. <laughs> Genesis chapter three, the end of Genesis, we see the effects of, of, of the fall of this disobedience. Adam and Eve, for the first time, are experiencing uh, this loss of innocence, this feeling of shame, this awareness that that they have. Uh, you know, violated the standards of God. Uh, they're experiencing a broken relationship with, with God, their creator, who they would have, it seemed like, had personal uh, physical interactions with, uh, their broken relationship with each other. They're blaming, they're accusing. Uh, there's a, a, you know, we'll see, it comes out in dysfunctions in their family. There's toil, there's, there's sweat, there's there, the, the creation itself has experienced a brokenness that they now have to live in. That, that's the result of the fall. We do see the glimpse of hope, the glimpse of redemption that, that will be coming in that. But uh, as we've been talking about Adam, the first Adam, and how he represents us and how he goes kind of the first uh, ex Adam and Eve uh, experiencing this for the first time, and all of us now as sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, uh, their experience at the end of Genesis chapter three is, is something we can relate to, that broken relationships, the separation from that personal relationship with God, uh, just the, the dysfunction and the brokenness that's so familiar to us. Um, is, is that, uh, in what way then, as you said, what is the significance? God, that could have been the end of the story. The Bible could have ended and said, you know, hey, I tried, I gave you an opportunity, I gave you every possible thing you needed to live in a perfect relationship with me, and you guys blew it. The story could have ended at, at Genesis chapter 3, but it, but it doesn't. Um, what is the significance of a second Adam? If, if we're living under the kind of the, the covering of the first Adam, what is the second Adam coming to do, and, and how, how does that relate to us now? Well, I think that's the beauty of the story. That's, that's, you know, why I start talking about the promises that are embedded in the curse that you know, Paul told the Ephesian church that even from the beginning of the foundation of the world, we were, we were already in his thoughts and we were already, he was already predetermining or pre, pre deciding at least that we should have this loving relationship with the father. He, he was smart enough. What do you think? God is smart enough that he anticipated that man given his free will would at some point rebel against him. And, and he had a relationship that, you know, it's not like I want to have, he was having a relationship with them. He was coming down face to face dealing with them. 
And what, what we see in Jesus, the second Adam, is that God had always intended, like as Steve says, Dr. Steve says, to make himself a family. To, you know, he, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world, to bring them into relationship to him. It's not, God did not want to curse man. God doesn't, you know, he didn't create hell for man. He didn't, he didn't make these things. You know, the penalty comes with the cosmic failure. And, uh, you know, just as much as if you jump off the roof, you're going to fall and probably break a leg, if, if, if nothing else. Uh, and those is sin and its judgment is, is and I think, and, and I'm, I'm going to maybe stretch it here, but it's, it's, think of it as a law of nature. It's God predetermined in the law of nature that if man morally rebels against God, he will have consequences that will lead to his death and his separation to God. So the, I don't think we understand enough that the, when Jesus said, you will die, that was a legal that was a legal sentence. But if you break the law, this is what's going to happen to you. And you break the law, the law of my character, the law of my nature, though the law, as we know in the Torah, wasn't there yet, but God had already established his moral character. And is and 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 sim the simplest of that is you will you obey me, you you please me, you do my will. And I think Jesus was necessary because God from the very beginning wanted a relationship with us that would require the penalty for the broken law that we would we would do. That's Dr. Steve, how do how do we move from representation by Adam to coming under the representation of Jesus? How, how do we obtain the benefits that the second Adam have, has achieved for us? Let me just talk about that second Adam just for a little bit more. Yeah. Um, as we said, compulsive sin was the question. Adam was not born compulsively sinful. He, but he was tempted, and Eve was tempted, and they chose... In a sense, it makes that, that whole thing really, really ugly. They, did, they didn't have to. We now are born separated spiritually from God and with sin literally in our flesh. So there's a compulsion on us that's it's virtually irresistible uh, in the long run, which we, we, we all know what that is. Uh, but Jesus Christ was the second Adam uh, Paul will call him that. He, he was born, as I said, he, he had our flesh. You know, he, he was fully human, but he did not have our spirit. His was not a spirit, as it were, where the candle had been lit from Adam. He, is, he came from heaven and dwelt in human flesh. You know, he became, he became I'm, body, my, I'm body, soul, and spirit, so was Jesus. But my spirit began in my mother's womb at conception. He came from, from, from eternity. He came to earth. So his spirit is not separated from the Father at all. He is one with the Father. That's, that's what he means by that kind of language. There's no separation. I'm born separated. He was not. He was born joined. Second Adam. Because Adam was that way too. So now Jesus, again... Now he, he has the capacity not to sin, but he's he can be tempted and he can give in just as well as Adam did. But he didn't. And he was tempted, as Richard pointed out, far more savagely. Far, I mean, there's no comparison. The, the temptation level that the Lord endured all the way through. I mean, you have, we, you know, we, we know that just, he just got hammered by hell and did not sin in any way, whereas all Adam and Eve had was this pretty looking fruit and the idea that they would choose right from wrong for themselves. You know, he's, 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 he's choosing savage, brutal death. He's choosing to become the filthy, bear the sin of the world. I think that's the worst part of it. I think in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he, when he, when he suffered the way he did, and knowing that he who knew no sin would become sin for our sake, Oh my goodness, to have the, the conscience of the sin of the world, to have, who knew no sin, and he was truly almost naive in a sense. 
his conscience, he had, he had no dirty conscience. Suddenly now he would become, all of this would pile on him. And he cried out, my, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, it, it's, it's enormous. So Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, he said, for since by man came death, by a man, forgive me, by a man, Adam, came death, by a man also the resurrection of the dead. So God is reversing what was done. Adam sent something into the, to his, his progeny, which now will, has damaged them all the way down. But now we have a second Adam, and he has brought a, the power to have victory over death, resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ, all will be made alive. Now, we can quibble over that. You say, well, that must mean all Christians, all believers. I actually, if you look at the Bible, all the righteous and the unrighteous will be resurrected. Christ literally defeated death for the human race. And so we have at the resurrection, you have the righteous and the unrighteous being resurrected. The, I, I often would say the good news is we all live, we live forever. The bad news is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're not prepared for that, you live forever. You do not end at death. I've said right. to people who think about suicide and you know, you're kidding yourselves. Yeah. You're kidding yourselves. You're just changing channels. You're just stepping over it and the same suffering, the same misery. And now, you're stuck in it forever. There is no relief ever. So <laughs> kind of sobers folks up going, whoa, that's, that's a bad idea. Yeah. You know, so Christ has defeated death. He has reversed. Death came in through Adam. Christ has brought physical life. Notice resurrection is what he said. And then those of us who know the Lord and have his atonement. So it's when and Richard's going there. Uh, we are with him in his glory forever. That's, that's so well put. That really gives you then, uh, the. we've kind of looked at the fall, and we've looked at the result, and what's in between there, going to Andrew's question, is the series of, of blood sacrifices that began to speak of the, the, the means by which the second Adam would bring about this atoning and this reconciliation to God because the sacrifice brings atonement, the covering for our sins, it brings the expiation of our sin, the removal of our sin, and it also brings uh, this freedom, this renewal of the inside, the change of heart, which was spoken about in the second covenant and all of that, but it had to do with the sacrifice of the animal, animal being the, the blood, the life, you know, uh, says I think Hebrew says that the the power of the blood is that it's the life's in the blood, and yes. so the blood symbolizes the life of a, of of something of of an animal or of a human, and so when that blood had to be sacrificed, so that God could be just in meeting out the judgment for sin, but He could be loving in that He had found a substitution for us through Jesus, and so Jesus is that substitute atoning in this case of the day of atonement it's the, there's the blood of the bull and the goat that cleanse the temple but then the actual sacrifices of the day of atonement for the public sin were these two goats and one was slain uh and it's, it's slaughtered as the bible says and its blood then was captured and brought into the holy of holies and sprinkled on the mercy seat and sprinkled uh, on the altar of you know, the sacrifice. So that the very sacrifices had to be purified first, which again, Jesus. Jesus is that pure sacrifice, and he's the pure high priest, sanctified without sin. So therefore, he fit the imagery perfectly. He fulfills it. And so the, the atonement is only one of several sacrifice stories in the Bible that are, are key ones, that, but they all speak of the penalty of sin, that sin has a penalty, that God is just and he has to apply the penalty. And secondly, that Jesus was that substitutionary vicarious in our place on our behalf, all the language you can use. 
for which I think generally it's referred to as substitutionary atonement that frees us and makes us right. So uh, Adam, the curse on Adam talked about the, the crushing the Satan's head. He did it at the cross. He did it through the power of the resurrection. Uh, that lamb, that animal that was slain that became their covering is the righteousness of Christ that's ours now available through his death and resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the, of the means of our atonement is the sacrifice life of Jesus. Yes, yeah. Man. And I'm going to back up again a little bit and try to work there through scripture to get to Jesus. But, you know, we've seen that the, the, the consequences, the effects of Adam's sin is that all of us like Adam and Eve are experiencing this uh, broken relationship with God, a separation from him, uh, sin, guilt, shame, all of that is part of uh, what sin does to us. Uh, and we're all facing this eternal consequences, eternal judgment that will be separation from God. Uh, Pastor Richard, you had a quote in your sermon from Grant Osborne that says, the, the effects of Adam's sin have been reversed for those who have experienced salvation. The universal consequences of the fall are overcome by the universal consequences of the cross. And that's getting to this whole picture, I think, is that uh, the way that happens is that sin is, needs to be paid for, needs to be punished. Guilt needs to be uh, 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 taken away. And ultimately, we, we can be the ones that, that have to do that just by our death and our eternal separation from God. But uh, like we saw with, with Adam being a representation uh, and Jesus being a representation, that uh, God has provided a way that a substitute can stand in our place to, to pay the penalty for sin. Uh, and we see that pictured uh, throughout scripture in the fact that, that a life is given for sin, whether that be a life of an animal or a life of a person. Uh, and we see that in the very beginning in Genesis, as you, as you alluded to, that even Adam and Eve experienced this substitution where their covering, the, the way that their sin is, uh, the effects of their sin are undone is that they are, their nakedness is covered. And, and it's by an animal skin, garments of skin for Adam and Eve. God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them. An animal had to die for the effects, the consequences of sin to be uh, undone. Um, so then, then we see more this unfold more and more clearly in scripture as a whole uh, God ordains a, a pattern, a way of, of animal sacrifices that can stand as a picture of this, this substitution. Um, Which, Andrew, Andrew, if I yeah. could just interject here, I mean, very quickly, because uh, I know Sunday I spoke on the atonement, but let's talk right away. You know, Cain and Abel, Abel offered an animal sacrifice, which was what God was looking for. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the conflict and all that. But the fact that the very first act sacrifice that God accepts is an animal sacrifice. Then you move forward. Certainly, you know, I, let's move forward over probably a few other ones. And, and another highlight is when uh, I, Abraham offers Isaac. I mean, that can be preached as well because, you know, that is so substitutionary. It's like the whole theme of that is substitution. Look over there, caught in the ram in the thorns is a ram who will take your place. And, uh, uh, and so Isaac gets spared, uh, though later the epistles say that, that Abraham, they believe that Abraham was confident that he would raise his son back to life if he took his life. That's how strong his confidence was. And, you know, so you keep moving through the scriptures and then Moses makes the sacrifice, codifies it, or God does through Moses. And then you end up with these rituals and ceremonies that were to be observed by all of Israel uh, for the for atonement and the day of atonement, which I spoke on Sunday, is one of those big uh, sacrifices. But that theme of sacrifice animals is highlighted all through the Old Testament, even up to the law. Let me ask uh, Dr. Steve, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, if, if you would kind of explain the mechanism. What is atonement? How does an animal or someone stand uh, in the place of somebody else? Um, and, and like I asked with the first question about whether it's fair that all of us could be represented by the actions of one person, Adam, is it fair in your understanding that someone could stand in the place 
uh, of someone else when it comes to taking sin, taking guilt, taking a wrath. So kind of what is atonement? How did it work in the Old Testament? How would they have understood what was happening in those sacrifices? And then kind of talk maybe about how how does that work? Is it fair that that someone could could take the penalty for somebody else? You you see the the, the that that whole idea of substitutionary atonement is is done all the way through. When it when it says they would offer a sacrifice, uh, you know it was it was as simple as this: you'd pile up the stones, uh, you would take the the goat, the lamb, whatever it was, um, you would lay your hands on its head. And you would confess your sins. And then you would cut its throat. And then you would offer it up in smoke uh, to the Lord. You're calling on God for mercy. Now notice the root of this thing. That laying on of hands is the key. God has so ordained it. I, I literally think he created this as he created the universe. He will allow the transfer of sin. To another were that not true if every person had to die for their own we're all done yeah. wage of sin is death but he allowed for transfer and was teaching that we keep going you know people hear people who are very naive and they don't know what they're talking about and they go oh, slaughterhouse religion what's all this blood and stuff sort of like it's pagan uh things and there certainly are pagan things that go on and all blood's thrown all over and drunk and poured over people and it's disgusting but that wasn't what was going on this is this is a clear spiritual lesson it says sin brings death and, and you'll notice like even with a passover lamb they're supposed to keep that little lamb right by the house where everybody can kind of get used to it and talk to it and beat its stuff you know and all that for, for what at four days and so you and then you have to cut this thing's throat and it was ugly then. It, it's supposed to be ugly. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be. This is what happens when you sin. Somebody dies. Yeah. But I'm going to allow you to take your sin and put it on this, this, this lamb, this goat, this bull, whatever it was. Though, as, as Hebrews points out so clearly, Nobody in their right mind thought that the blood of bulls and goats actually atoned for the, for the moral sins of the human race. It was clearly a symbolic type. It was clearly God teaching a principle, not saying this dead goat just took your sins. Uh, that was not the point. But it is, God was showing from, and as you said, from Cain and Abel, and from really from Adam and Eve, from the very beginning, that he would allow your sin to be transferred to another. And so you'd lay those hands, you'd cut the throat, you'd, you'd do it. And of course, you've got that glorious thing there you re referred to, Richard, in, in Genesis uh, 22 with, with uh, Abraham, where he offer, he's about to offer Isaac, which is completely unnatural. There's nothing God hates more than human sacrifice so this whole thing is just bizarre and he's and he's following through on what he feels god's telling him to do and then then it says he looked and he saw the angel says stop your hand abraham for now i know you you you, you love me and then he said and then there's a ram caught in the thicket by its horns and abraham went and and so here you have now think of this because mount he was on where was he he traveled from beersheba you go up the you go up the Hebron uh, stream bed. So that's the highways of the ancient times. Often, you go up the you go up the you go up the stream bed. It's fifty miles up into the hills. Fifty miles. He takes Isaac fifty miles with wood and a, and a, probably a donkey to carry this thing and fire, and walks fifty miles where to Mount Moriah. You know what Mount Moriah is. Mount Moriah is right where the temple would be built. Mount Moriah is, the top end of Mount Moriah, is where Jesus was crucified. So probably 100 yards away, the Lord's cross was going to be stuck. Yeah, like, well, I wonder what that all signifies. <laughs> he sends him 50 miles to a spot. And then he says, offer your son. Then he has no don't. 
because I will. I will often. And then he, and Abraham names, check this out. Abraham names the place Jehovah Jireh. Now we get all these songs about the Jehovah Jireh, meaning I'm going to go to Cadillac. It, Je, what it says is Jehovah Jireh, he named it Jehovah Jireh, for in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be supplied. What? The sacrifice will be supplied in Mount Moriah. Now, hang on. And so every time they blow the ram's horn, the ram goes back to this ram. Wow. Every time they stand, they go, they're reminding God that he promised a sacrifice in the mountain for them. Wow, that's powerful. Yes. It's yeah, and, and you know, uh, and underscoring all of this is the terribleness of our sin. Yes. We, that's where we all, I, I'll say, I'll speak for myself, I think many of us struggle with really the acute awareness of what a grave offense our sin is yes. to a holy, righteous God that has no sin tolerance, as you might say, in his divine perfection. Uh, but yet he so wants us to be there that by grace, uh, you see, he doesn't look at Jesus' sacrifice as symbolic at all. Jesus' sacrifice is the real deal. Yes, it is. He shed his real blood in the real Holy of Holies, and he paid the penalty that for my sin. He, he bore my penalty. And God, through through, you know, as though God himself reached out his hand and, and like you say, brutalized his son for us so that he would be the perfect sacrifice for us. And Jesus willingly, like Isaac did, which that's amazing that Isaac went willingly with his dad, even to being laid up on the plat on the altar. Uh, again, so picture it. So the Bible has created this vivid imagery that, but all points to Jesus. Jesus is the real deal. He's the one that paid the penalty for my sin. And uh, you know, I, I, we were talking earlier, and I, 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 re I read this illustration. I, I just really think it's so powerful that when we say his sacrifice, you know, got us our forgiveness, it's not that God, that made God happy, so therefore he said, I'll forgive you. It's, it's a legal, it's, it's, it's a legal act of court. The divine court in heaven said, the judge supreme said, you're guilty, and you're guilty of death because you defied my character, my, my law. I will exact that penalty, but I will be just and I will exact that penalty, but in my grace, I will provide a substitute. As, as I heard one phrase, that statement, he himself becomes our, our, our provision. You know, I love that phrasing of Amen. he himself became our provision. Uh, and on the mountain, he will provide, he will be our provision. And so, you know, that, you know, and, and Leviticus, the story of the atonement is exactly that reenactment. The one goat, they lay their hands on and they confess their sin and it's taken outside the camp. It's that ab abandonment. It's, it speaks both things. Our sins are taken away from us, but also it speaks of the abandonment and the banishment that sin, the curse of sin is for us. Uh, I love it then when Hebrew says, let us therefore go outside the camp. To, and, and, and meet Jesus outside the camp where he, meaning that he was our scapegoat. And then they lay, then they confess, the, the high priest confesses all this, and they had to be there a while, confessing all the sins of Israel at that time. And then they slaughter the animal. And, and what, a, what a powerful picture of both the loving grace of God that his son would come because he loved us so much that to give himself is that, to, to be that sacrifice, but, but the sacrifice, I, in a sense, I guess, would say loses its meaning if we don't understand the severity of our penalty. And we, we speak of the consequences, the personal consequences of, of sin decays me, sin gets me addicted, sin makes me dysfunctional, sin makes me anxious, sin makes me fearful. Yes, all of those things, which is usually why we come to Jesus. But at some point, we got to recognize that we're, we're in that condition because we're sinners and we're separated from God were it not for the grace of his atoning sacrifice on the cross. As, as we, as modern American readers, uh, read, read the Bible, we're confronted constantly with these 
this is blood, these sacrifices. Uh, I think we're, we're tempted to be put off by that, to wonder, like you said, to kind of think this is kind of an ancient, primitive uh, sort of thing that, that we sophisticated uh, people no longer find necessary or important. It's something that, that they did in kind of their ignorance and naivete. But I think as we're learning, what we should be seeing in those pictures is what was intended by God. And that is the, the terribleness of sin. Sin is something horrible that has brought uh, brokenness, destruction, uh, separation in, into the world. And, and uh, the consequences of sin require uh, a severe uh, uh, reaction, a consequence to that. And all of us, as, as we read scripture, we're just constantly bombarded again with the terribleness of sin, the terribleness of the consequences of sin, the separation that sin causes between us and God, the, the judgment that is due to sin. But I think it also then points to the fact that God didn't leave us there, leave us with just the consequences of sin. He himself has provided uh, an answer, a remedy uh, and that is that there is a substitute available that will bring about that reconciliation, that, that atonement, that the covering of sin, the removal of sin and its consequences, that, that, that reconciliation that we can have with God, that, that bringing back uh, of the wholeness and the shalom that God intended for all of creation is, is only done when the, that problem of sin and this problem of its consequences is dealt with in this gruesome, bloody, uh, decisive act of, of somebody dying for that sin. Yeah. Uh, it, it, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to add, you know, the, the language of the sacrifice of God, of Christ for us, is that it covered our sin. When it said it covered, it doesn't mean it covered them up. It's really referring to the fact that the mercy seat was the lid of the, of the Ark of the Covenant. And under that, they kept the broken tablets of the law. And, 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 and they kept the law there. And, when, and figuratively, this blood is, is sprinkled on what it was called the mercy seat. And that mercy seat was the lid of that Holy of Holies. And there, God covered our sin because when he looked you know figuratively when he looks at our sin he sees the blood of jesus that has covered our sin it's a it's not a cover up or like i'm going to just cover up and put a put a robe over your sin it is literally saying god has covered it and he's covered the penalty he's blotted out our transgressions by the shedding of his blood we're cleansed from our sin because we're made right with god and we're purified and so the cleansing, the forgiveness. I love First John 1 John 1.8 says, "What if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that. that that's what Jesus did for us at the cross. And, and it, it's bloody and it's brutal. And our American sensibilities try to, uh, you know, make it not so, uh, you know, we want to try to make it more sanitary. But the, the brutality of the sacrifice was commensurate with the with the repugnance of God's of sin to God and 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 his heart to decide to cleanse us and to make us right with him is is just um, it's you know how he said this is the story of love this is how we know God loved us that he sent his son to die in our place sorry I had just I got excited yeah yeah that's great those Dr. Steve uh, the idea that in the cross and in, in the work of Jesus uh crucifixion provided a way for God to be both just and the justifier. What, what does that mean? And how was the cross the means for God to be able to do that? Uh, God, uh, God does deal with justice. There is such a thing as justice. Uh, and this is, this is why the question, and you were bringing it up about in, in the sermon about atonement, versus just forgiveness. The idea of forgiveness, I think you started out with that. The idea of forgiveness is like, hey, it doesn't bother me. I don't care. Just forget it. Let's all forget it and move on. Put it in the past and move on. That's kind of the American mantra, isn't it? And, and so it's like you just blow it off, like whatever. I don't care. God doesn't do that. 
I, I, I've, I've said before, God isn't tolerant at all. Uh, he's, he's merciful. There's a huge difference. So he would, he, if, if, if he's going to, for forgiveness to come, there, there is a, a justice that must be satisfied. And great offense and great death has been brought in. And so he had to prepare a sacrifice for us there. Who and what sacrifice could possibly morally uh, in justice pay for the sin of the, of the human race, which is just unspeakably enormous. I mean, one person's death, no matter how good a person, well, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So if, if I want to satisfy justice, my, my satisfying justice is that I die and it'll cover my sin. That's the penalty for my, for my life. You know, I'm dead. But who could die for everyone? Yeah. And this is why when you get wrong on Jesus, when you get muddled on who he is, you really, you really don't know what you're doing. God, he, here we have a very unique person. We have, we have someone who is fully human. We have someone who is, who is tempted in all ways like as we, inherited our flesh, but not our spirit. It, tempted in all ways like as we, yet without sin. So he's sinless, he's spotless. And here we have the eternal divine son of God who is, who is of, of moral value and holiness, of, of just sheer goodness beyond the weight of human sin. So we, th this is the only person, God only has one son. There isn't another atonement. There isn't another sacrifice for the sins of the world. There, there is nothing else. He, th but he gave his own son and he tempt, allowed, allowed him to be savagely tempted. He, he passed it. And then he willingly brought, chose death for us. And then, the, then in doing so, actually snapped the hold of death on the human race. Because he, he, here, here's, a true, here's a true human being dying, and death cannot hold him. Right. And he rises from the dead and brings us with him. And that's why when we're water baptized, you'll notice we're buried together with Christ. We're not just buried in a grave. Buried together with Christ, raised with him, with him, in newness of life. Paul, Paul will actually use... These, in Colossians, he uses these three participles. And, and literally, one is buried together with, the other is raised together with, the other is made, made alive together with. And it's all one word, just stuck into a big, big participle. And, and so we, we, don't just, we don't just watch Jesus die, but when we, when we put our faith in him, we join him so that, that we die with him on the cross. We rise with him from his grave. His death becomes ours, and here's the wonder of it. God counts that death as my death. Wow, that's powerful. That's what... So I have died for my sins in Christ. In Christ. And that's I'm now, awesome. and grave couldn't hold me, as I came up with him. So I am already seated in heavenly places with Christ. I'm already, death has lost its grip on me. I am now joined to Christ and, and alive forevermore. My body will, fall, will, 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 will die, but my spirit is completely joined to him. And, and I will step instantly right through the veil into his presence. And then at the trumpet, I'm getting a brand new body, at which I will, my resurrection, because he's defeated all of it. And now I live in that glorious state as a child of God in a resurrection body so that I can bear the glorious, I see the, the father has restrained his glory. And it's in heaven, but he's restrained it. It'll, it'll, it'll burn everything up. There'll come a day when I can walk into the unrestrained Shekinah glory of God and not be destroyed by it. The kind that Paul oh. saw when he saw Christ on the, on the road to Damascus and it blinded him. That's we're going to live in that, people. We're, you know, C.S. Lewis made a comment. He said, if you could see the lowliest Christian after the resurrection, he said, if you didn't know better, you'd bow down and worship.
That's, that's who we are. We're the children of God. That's the transforming work of the substitutionary death of Christ. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's it, what we, it is. You we, we're we're getting close stuff. to an hour here, so we're going to close up. But it's, we've moved in this hour from the very, very bad news to the very, very good news. The bad news of our identity that we have in Adam to the good news of the identity that's available in Christ. The bad news of, of what took place in the Garden of Eden moved all the way through to the good news of, of being able to be part of the new creation that, that God is, is working us toward. And the good news, the bad news of, of the consequences of sin, the good news of the, the, the benefits and the consequences of, of the sacrifice that Jesus made to atone us from those sins. So thank you, gentlemen, for your for your discussion on this. Pastor Richard, um, as we close, just want to give us a quick touch, uh, heads up on what maybe what you're going to talk about um, well, in the coming weeks. I, I, I think the next, I wanted to speak on, uh, I'm actually still debating, it's Friday, but I'm still mm -hmm. debating on, uh, probably was going to do the, the Passover, going to talk about the Passover mm -hmm. sacrifice. And uh, that's one of the, another one of the great, uh, uh, great sacrifices that Jesus made for, you know, that represents what Jesus did for us to set us free and pay the penalty of our sin. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you again, gentlemen, for joining me. And thank you all for uh, joining us for another deep dive discussion. If you want more information about uh, Grace Scottsdale, if you want to learn more about the, the messages and the series that we're going through right now, you can find all of that at our website, gracescottsdale.com. Uh, look forward to our next discussion. Uh, thank you all for joining us.